Hi everyone, this is Jason Burak of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest. He has 25 years of experience in the financial industry. He's a money manager and financial expert. Ed Batowski, thank you for joining me here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Now, um, Ed, you, uh, the way I found you through the internet is someone told me about this Chapwood Inflation Index. Um, there, there's been a lot of problems with the Consumer Price Index. There's, there's a lot of people who are not on Wall Street who don't like the index at all, and it seems you're an entrepreneur and you've gone and solved a major problem here. Uh, what, in your opinion, is wrong with the Consumer Price Index? Well, there's a tremendous amount wrong with the Consumer Price Index, and the CPI is put out by the Bureau of Labor of Statistics. And many years ago, and it really started in 1983, so prior to 1983, the way the government measured the cost of living increase uh, is that they measured 1,700 items, and they literally every month just priced them and calculated the price increase, and that was the number. So when people got raises, it was reflecting 1,700, ba- 1700 items in a basket. But in 1983, they, were, they found themselves spending a lot of money because prices were rising, and they were spending a lot of money in increases in Social Security, um, and increases in other types of entitlement programs. So they calculated that number different. They literally went in and consciously changed the way they were calculating it, and they made certain things weighted a certain way. They took certain things out. They played a lot of games. So the cost of living increase, or CPI, decreased. And this allowed people to or allow the government not to put out as much money in increases each year, thus saving money for the government. They also changed it in 93, 94, and they continue to make lots of different manipulative changes to that number. And to this point, or to this day, that number doesn't reflect anything that really goes on in this world at all. There's no real relevance to look at someone and say that your cost went up 1% last year when the real cost went up about nine to 10 times that for you to keep pace with what you did last year, this year. Yeah, I completely agree. I I don't think people should need a PhD in statistics to tell that their bills are going up. I mean, my food bill since I graduated college in 2006 is up substantially. The portion sizes have dropped. My healthcare bill is going up. Rents around where I live are going up. And your index, when I look at it, it just seems really reasonable. Um, I, I'd like some you know, input then on the methodology then for how you uh, calculate some of the price increases because I'm looking at your index and the cost of living increases are either high single digit, 9% inflation for many major cities in the U.S. or they're in double digits for really the last number of years, which seems right on based on the on how my bills have uh, risen. Yeah, well, well, I appreciate you seeing that. And uh, how I put this together many years ago, I realized that clients just didn't know how much more it cost them the, to, to keep pace with the year before. So I went out and I put a list together of everything that I thought that they spent money on, and I gave it to them, and I said, let's do this for a year to keep up with what your costs go up. And I gave it to about 10 clients, and not one of them did it. In fact, one of them transferred their account because they thought it was ridiculous. I asked them to do it. But I was trying to figure out what rate of return I needed to target for them. And when that didn't work, I thought, you know, I still have to do this. So then I realized I have Facebook friends in cities all over the United States. So I put out a plea to everybody to send me what they spend their after-tax money on. And I got about 4,000 different uh, items that people spend their after-tax money on. And I narrowed it down to the ones that appeared the most often, to the top 500. Then I realized that there was a man named John Williams, who a lot of people who study this know very well. He has a a great website called Shadow Statistics. And I called him up and I said, here's the problem I have with what you're doing. You're not breaking it down city by city because certain cities, the cost of living increase um, is far greater than other cities. For instance, I knew that San Francisco, the cost of living there went up. Not the cost of living, uh, Jason, but the cost of living increase went up dramatically, much more so than other cities. And I said, why don't you do it that way? And he said, well, I don't have time to do it. i got too many other things to do. And if you know uh, Mr. Williams, you know, you know you can imagine what I just said is true. 
so I thought, well, why don't I do this? Why don't I go out to the top 50 cities, find Facebook friends that I have, and ask them if every quarter they would go and update the numbers. And I got people in every city. A couple of them I had to get referred over to because I didn't have people, I didn't have friends in a couple of cities. And then they got a little tired of doing it quarterly, so I broke it down to do it semi-annually. And my numbers, I know, reflect the real after-tax cost of living increase for people in those cities. And if you look at the Chapwood Index, you'll see that cities that have heavy tax burdens are the ones that cost of living increase goes up the most. It's, it's really easy to see that. Yeah, I actually live right outside of Washington, D.C., and your numbers here are pretty much almost 11%, 12% per year inflation rate. I, I would definitely agree with that, having lived here for a while. My bills just keep seeming to go up, and I'm not getting any wage increases when I was an employee. Now I'm an entrepreneur. But um, in, in terms of like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I think you brought up a very valid point. There's a lot of Ph.D. statisticians running there, and they keep playing so many games. We've heard uh, Peter Schiff put out a report a number of years ago about the problems with the CPI. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but uh, you know they don't count the core CPI, which is food, rent, health care, gasoline. I mean these are things that people have to use every single day, and yet they're not counted. There's substitution, which I think the formula assumes, right, that if the price of steak goes up uh, too much in the next two years, that you and me will stop eating our steaks uh, grilling out there for summer barbecue that will immediately switch to hamburger or chicken or something else. And then there's sedonics and geometric weighting. These are all ridiculous. None of these things work in the real world, uh, Ed. No, they don't. And, and Peter, I love Peter. I, I love his work. Uh, but he, the, the thing that really impacts it the most and things that aren't, cost, uh, aren't calculated into it are taxes and insurance. Um, and those are, those are big numbers. I mean, your tax increases are not figured into the CPI. Your state and uh, federal uh, income taxes are just not factored into this. And, and that's real problematic as well. Um, so everything that we do on the Chapwood Index measures the real cost of living increase on an after-tax basis. Now, that means after you bring in your money, how much you have to pay, that includes taxes on food. That includes taxes on gasoline and so on. And these, it's like a little shoplifting here or there, but it adds up. So that is why I built the Chapwood Index. Now, some people will say, well, why don't you go into a lot more detail about your methodology? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it's not so scientific. It's just pretty you know, basic stuff. And people who want to argue with it can all day long, but all they have to do is say, you know what? If I got a 3% raise, why is it that my life didn't get any better? Why is it that I'm falling behind? And that's because your real cost of living increase is probably about 7% higher than that. So you're losing ground. And it really impacts, Jason, a lot of the young people, excuse me, a lot of the older people in this country who live off of Social Security, whose Social Security income increased was about 1%, but their cost went up 10%. And the same thing for people who live off of a pension or Social Security or anything along those lines that is tied to the CPI. But I'm going to go one step further, and this is a very important thing for people to know, that a lot of people who have salaries for their income, and some of these people are middle-income people, some are lower-income people, but if they have a salary, and that salary increase is tied to the CPI, they will never get further ahead. They'll never go anywhere in terms of feeling better about their income because if they get an income in the private sector tied to the CPI, which is a bogus statistic, then that increase of 3% doesn't keep pace with their rising cost of living. So a lot of people who are middle income and lower income their salary increases are tied to the CPI. People who are paid on performance, they don't have to worry about that because they're going to get paid based on their ability to perform, and it's not tied to the CPI. It's tied to their performance. Yeah, the cost of living adjustments gives the government an incentive to cheat, whether it's a government employee on his pension plan or someone on Social Security or a military retiree. There's an incentive there for them to not want to say what the real inflation rate is so they can keep you know, printing more dollars and not have to give people uh, you know, uh, more and more check uh, government benefits. 
But what what's your opinion on the chain CPI? Do you think this is just another game that's going to be added to the CPI to make it even more distorted uh, and not reflect reality even more? Without question. I mean, it, it, you know, this is just and, – and everyone is in agreement with this. This is the one thing that scares me is that Republicans – and I, I lean right, um, very right, um, but this is wrong. Um, but they do this to try to reduce the amount of money that we're spending in these entitlement programs um, and Social Security programs and so on. And Democrats are supportive of it as well. It scares the daylights out of me because people are only going to find themselves – falling further and further behind. It is a death spiral that we're in as it relates to this number and all the negative things that are associated with it. Yeah, it seems like stagflation, based on your numbers and what I see in the real economy and talking to the, the many thousands of people all over the all over the United States and world who listen to our podcast, it seems to me, Ed, that we're in worsening stagflation in the real economy, and I think your numbers would indi- indicate that. You know, when we have inflation of those levels, you know, people's wages, for the most part, most people, they're not able to keep up, and that's worsening stagflation, in my opinion, in the real economy. Well, it's, it's funny you bring up stagflation because uh, you know, I, I wrote an article many years ago about you know, that we're here and we are in stagflation. The only problem is I call it modern-day stagflation because the statistics don't support it from a textbook, but in real life, it's called real-life stagflation. And we don't have rising you know, wages, and, and uh, we do have runaway inflation uh, prices, and we do have slow economic growth, and we do have very high unemployment. You know, obviously, the first part of what I said didn't factor into you know, what the wages don't really factor into stagflation, but we have stagflation, and that is a gift that we have been given, and we could uh, get out of it with doing one thing, and that is reducing taxes across the board because that's the only way to cure it. Um, now, in, in terms of inflation, I want to ask you about another part of inflation that Wall Street is just sweeping under the rug. They pretend it doesn't exist, is inflation in asset prices. Yes, I agree with you that we do have a lot more inflation in the real economy than is being reported. But one thing I see where we have an enormous amount of inflation, at least to me, and you know, you have more experience than I do m- managing money, but it seems there's been an enormous amount of the inflation that's been created, whether it's in the United States or other countries. It's gone into – uh, the general stock market, it's gone into bonds, it's gone into real estate in major cities, it's gone into diamonds, it's gone into art, it's gone into rare collectibles and things like that. Is is that also what you see is that the asset prices are being inflated and not being uh, counted as inflation? Um, no, because I don't think a lot of asset prices are being inflated. Um, uh, you know, In terms of what you just said, I mean diamonds, I know diamonds very well and, and they've suffered a little bit in this market um, and obviously gold and, and other commodities – in that respect, I think the increases in things, the cost of things, has a lot to do with tax increases that get trickled down into um, the cost and the, and the prices of these items. Uh, so that, that in itself is a very different subject about costs going up uh, on, different, um, on, on different assets. I mean, real estate prices are going up. Uh, and that's a different category than inflation uh, or, you know, your traditional price inflation. It depends on where the location is and what it is. I mean, in New York City, you can see buildings going up in price. And, you know, California, you can see it as well. And in Dallas, you can see it on commercial real estate. But there's some markets where costs of the houses aren't rising as fast as others. So that's more of a regional discussion and more of a, a discussion based on, uh, you know, what type of real estate we're talking about. Gold and silver, we know those aren't rising, and diamonds aren't rising, and oil has certainly fallen off. Okay, fair, fair enough. Well, uh, you're considered an expert in uh, uh, helping professional athletes diversify money. You're featured in a documentary and on ESPN and also on Sports Illustrated, I guess. Um, we're seeing in a lot uh, – our company is a financial education company. We focus on trying to get people to learn about business and investing and entrepreneurship and finance. Uh, we just see so many of these current event stories, whether it's Dwight Freeney losing tens of millions of dollars or Tim Duncan, I think, just lost, uh, uh, announced publicly he lost $25 million. Why, in your opinion, do you think um, these professional athletes who, who earn such a high income, why are they losing so much money so quickly then? Well, you know, that, that is an area that I'm involved with quite a bit. I, I represent, you know, some, uh, a number of people, and I'm kind of at the forefront of the educational part of this. Uh, in, in terms of the business, and uh, you know, Dwight Freeney, um, I, I think you're. I know a lot about that, and I will tell you that I think that 
you're going to find out that Bank America had basically nothing to do with any money that he lost, and it has to do a lot more with just him following the advice of some lady who didn't work at Bank America anymore. Um, and I, I find it surprising that that so much attention was drawn to that, uh, only because mainly because he came out and started talking about it. But the a lot of people in the athlete world, you know, will invest in things that they're familiar with. So they might invest in a company because they understand the company, or they understand car washes, or you know, they might understand something that they can put their hands on. And they sometimes think that that's investing. And they don't know, uh, in, in a lot of cases, that there's only been two 10-year time periods where people lost money in the stock market. But if you ask any of them, and I go around talking to all the teams and all the leagues, if you ask them how many people think you can lose all your money in the stock market, they almost always raise their hand. And the truth is, between 1927 and 37 and 28 and 38, that was the only time period that you lost money in a 10-year time horizon in the stock market, and you averaged losing 1%. There's a lot of bad information out there um, about that. And most people who invest as young people and diversify in public securities, they're never going to go broke as long as they keep their spending intact. And so it's a very big subject. It's a long subject for us to talk about, but you will continue to see these come up and we're doing our best to educate people about how to never go broke. And I give a lot of speeches um, around to leagues and teams on this subject. But it's also the same thing, Jason, for individuals. You got a lot of people who do a lot of stupid, silly things uh, with their money and get really messed up. You hear about athletes because the numbers are big and you know who they are. But that's the only reason. Yeah, they they have higher incomes though than than the average guy. I mean, the average guy right now is maybe making fifty, seventy grand. The professional athlete, the uh, the the minimum the minimum salary for a major league baseball player, I think, is like two hundred fifty, two hundred seventy five grand. So I mean, it's a, it's it's an almost an order of magnitude higher. So I think that's why these things get portrayed in the news a lot more. Right. I know. But um. But um, in, in terms of like some of these athletes, I mean, do do you think do you think uh, they just get bad advice from family members, or are they uh, on the hook then to to pay f- the bills for way too many family members? Do you, do you think that's why they end up going broke, or or they can't cut their expenses when their careers are over? It's impossible to make a general statement, Jason, because there's a lot of people, a lot of these athletes that don't go broke. Okay, um, and I. You know, I'm, I'm around them. I mean, this isn't something that I'm just saying because, you know, I, I just want to have an opinion. I know there's a lot that don't have, um, uh, you know, a lot of support in respect to understanding investing. And, and I'm the first one to tell you that the leagues need to do a better job of educating them. I'm actually meeting with Major League Baseball next week on the subject. So that at the same time, if they keep their spending under control, they should be in good shape but a lot of them don't. But the leagues need to do a better job, and they need to pick the right people to help them do a better job. And the leagues are not doing their job as well as they could because they need to be there in the forefront of educating these people. Yeah, I know they have seminars like on rookie day at the NFL, either at the Combine or uh, right after when the guys go to rookie camps. Right. But it might only be like one or two experts for an hour or something like that. And most of the guys are probably, you know, doing social media, uh, tweeting girlfriends and things like that. They might not be paying full attention well, as much as they should. Yeah, so, so that's true with anybody. I mean, it's not just athletes, but the NFL has the worst program. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, a program that in many cases – you know, the the rookie program I can't speak to, but these other programs that they have um, are are horrible. They're they're teaching these people how to be entrepreneurs, and you know it's like that's like taking a you know somebody with a drug addiction program uh, or a drug addiction to um, a place where they sell drugs. I mean, the worst thing you can do is be encouraging these people to go into business with their own money um, because most of these businesses fail anyway. So I'm yeah. not a big fan of the NFL program. The NBA does an okay job. I was the financial literacy uh, expert for the NFL, uh, NBA for a while, and we put programs together, and they've got a very good program. They have some very good people working there, and um, Major League Baseball needs to pick up their program quite a bit, and uh, hockey doesn't have anything. 
you know, it's it, it's just really sad that these guys they make so much money and then a good percentage of them end up broke. You know, you'd think that they would be more conservative or just hold the cash and then educate themselves and figure it out, but that's not what happens statistically, at least like in uh, certain leagues. Well, yeah, you got to worry about those statistics. That statistic that's out there, Jason, about 78% of the people in the NFL five years after they retire are broke. That, that's actually a, a lie. Um, that statistic was completely made up in 2002, um, and um, they, that, that's just not true at all, uh, that statistic. Uh, it was made up by somebody who was just leaving a meeting, and some reporters, uh, some USA Today reporter yelled to somebody at the NFL meeting, what percentage of the players you know, go broke? And he said, I just need a number. And the, this guy just randomly said, 78%, and that number has lived forever. So, you know, it, it's still not a good situation, uh, but there's a lot of people who do, you know, who, who aren't doing so bad with their money. Um, but we, you know, certainly hear a lot of bad ones. We know that. Uh, changing topics, uh, back to inflation and beating inflation. You know, most m money managers, they don't account for the real inflation rates that you have with the Chapwood Inflation Index. Uh, do, do you think do you think that they they know what the real inflation rate is and they they just don't really care because they they don't know how to beat the uh, you know eight percent ten percent per year or do you think that they're just going to consider the government's uh, inflation rate a one to two percent an easier bar to beat for them? Well, that's a, that's kind of a, a a general you know statement because I don't know who these money managers are. Most people who are managing large pools of money, um, they their goals um, are to beat a benchmark, um, and that's what their goal is. So anybody who's an equity manager is trying to beat the equity index. Um, anybody who's a bond manager is trying to beat a bond index, and that's how these long-only managers look at things. So I think the goal of a portfolio manager is their benchmark. A goal of someone like me, who's an advisor uh, uh, to, you know, registered advisor, our job is to make sure we understand what our clients' needs are. Okay, very good. Yeah, I mean, normally, like, money managers or fund managers, their goal is to beat inflation and beat their index. But the, the ones I hear on CNBC and Bloomberg, most of them, they don't even talk about inflation. They just kind of laugh it off and say, oh, inflation's 1% and is insignificant yeah. and doesn't well, matter. I know. They accept it. It drives me crazy, too. I, I, I just can't believe that those people will say those things. Um, but it also benefits them uh, to say that because, you know, they can say, hey, look, as long as I'm making above inflation, we're okay. But – you know, people like you and I go the extra mile and say, you know what, let's start being honest with people. And that's what we need to do. And that's what I do. And, you know, so if someone says, look, you know, my cost of living only went up 2%. I don't care where they live. That's just not true. There's just not a chance in the world that is an accurate statement. Yeah, and the food to add to support your argument there, the food companies, like whether it's Chipotle or many other food producers, they're actually admitting on their conference calls that they're uh, reducing the portion size and their costs are going up, which are higher than the CPI rate. So I, I, I believe that's being called shrinkflation now, where the portion size, where the price maybe at the grocery store or the restaurant may stay the same or only goes up a little bit, but the portion size is dropping. So that's still right. inflation. It's just not the same thing. Oh, I notice it all the time. I and mean, if you saw a picture of me, you know I'm not the thinnest guy in the world, but I go – um, when I go to a restaurant and I get like a chicken salad, I, I am looking for that chicken, and all the time it's just less and less chicken everywhere. I mean, I can't even find the chicken sometimes in my chicken salad. Um, you know, they're always cutting costs everywhere they can, but you can't blame them because they're being taxed to death, and they have to report to their shareholders. So you know what? Chipotle's got to report to their shareholders their job is to stay in business, stay, you know, keep customers coming, but find a way to turn a profit. And yep. it gets tough. But you're right yeah, on. I mean, you're a young guy, and you're following exactly where, you know, you need to be. And that is understanding how this stuff works. Um, and it's very smart what you've done. It's, uh, I wish more people would understand exactly what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's. I think the goal is to beat the inflation rate every single year with your investing returns. Uh, my final question for you, Ed, before I let you go, uh, going forward, um, do, do you think the government's going to be able to keep, you know, playing games with the CPI for many years longer, and Americans aren't going to figure out what's going on? Do you, Do you think we're going to see this? I guess uh, stat worsening stagflation in the real economy for many years longer, where it's going to be tougher than to beat inflation with your investing returns going forward. Uh, yeah, I think uh, things are terrible and are going to get worse. 
I think uh, <laughs> I just do. I know. I, I see us. Um, I, I, and you're in Texas. You're where the jobs are being created, right? You're in the shale boom, right? So you, you've had a, a nice run there for a while since 2008. Well, yeah. I mean, regardless of wherever you are, your costs go up, and I think the government will continue to raise taxes. I mean, we're, we're what, $700 billion short this year. At least that's what we're projected to be. So the government can only – the only way government makes money is by, what, raising taxes. So we're going to see more taxes being raised. That's going to trickle down to your cost. And you're going to pay more. And then eventually the economy is going to just, you know, slow down to not move at all. And and then we're going to see that go down. So, you know, it's it's not a good situation in any way, shape, or form. And I'm, you know, I know, you know, I sound like a gloom and doomer, um, but but I also know what I'm saying is true. Yeah, we're we're going to see the government increase the inflation tax. I think we're going to see them layer on more and more taxes, whether it's increasing Obama taxes or uh, we've heard uh, if the Democrats gain control of Congress, they want to put a national online sales tax or a VAT tax in carbon cap and trade. You know, they're they're talking about so many different taxes where they can uh, get you, you know, one or two percent more, so most people won't even notice, but it'll be layered on in so many different ways. That I think that's I think that's the modus operandi going forward. Yeah, um, and none of that is good for an economy. None of it is good for jobs. I mean, we need to get 500,000 net new full-time jobs a month just to create enough revenue to offset our deficit, let alone our long-term debt. And that, you know, I get that number because a $50,000 a year full-time job, as you stated earlier, at a 25% federal tax rate is $12,500. Well, we need about 6 million new full-time jobs to get us enough money just to offset our debt, or, or excuse me, our annual deficit. And the jobs right now we're averaging is about 200,000 a month, if you can believe that number, and about half of those are full-time jobs. So Yeah, I don't I don't believe that number. I think the birth-death yeah. model is doing most of it. And most of the – I live in Washington, D.C. area, like I said, and that has a really low unemployment rate. But there's a lot of people I know, 20 and 30-somethings, who have two or three part-time jobs. And I think the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Department of Labor now count that as uh, – the same as the full-time job now in the in the jobs report. Yeah. It, so you know what? Anybody listening to this podcast, everything we're talking about is real. And um, so, what do you do as an investor? Well, there's many different things, but you got to find a, a good way to make some money and be not completely correlated to the stock market. But I, I appreciate you having me on, Jason. I really do. I enjoy talking with you. Great. Now, um, Ed, please tell our listeners more uh, where they can find their re- – they can actually look up their uh, their city on the Chapwood Inflation Index and also more about your uh, your uh, money management firm. Well, sure. You can go to Chapwood Index, so it's C-H-A-P-W-O-O-D index.com, and that's where you can look at things. And, and I manage money. I'm a, a, you know, a guy who manages money for individuals in, in the Dallas area. And um, so thank you very much for taking the time, Jason. Okay, great. And uh, hopefully we can have you on again soon, and hopefully inflation isn't isn't massively increasing. I appreciate it. Thank you. I look forward to it.